At this time, Dr. Annie Bukacek has a short but very important presentation to give us. I'm Pastor Chuck Baldwin, Liberty Fellowship in Kalispell, Montana. Many of you in the congregation recognize her as one of the last surviving private practice independent doctors in the Valley. Plus, she has been voted best family physician in the Flathead for the last five consecutive years. But today, her topic is related to her position as public service commissioner, a four-year position for which she was elected in November of 2022. But she is speaking as an individual, and nothing she says should be construed as reflective of the policies or opinions of the Public Service Commission or any other organization. So we're going to have to move the podium because uh, there's going to be a slide presentation along with her speech. So we'll give a moment for that. But please, let's all give a good warm welcome to our very own Dr. Annie Bukacek. grateful to Pastor for this opportunity. The, the substance of this presentation today has been really burdening me heavily for, for quite a long time, and Pastor knows that, so I'm grateful for the opportunity. So I'm going to talk about strategy for keeping the lights on. Last year, we had some blackouts uh, across the nation, we, including in Montana, and strategies always need to include facts, of course. They, the strategies need to be feasible. They also need to incorporate risk-benefit analysis. And I haven't seen too much of that happening in the energy sector. And so uh, we need to really get on the thick. Now this is the North American, North American Electricity Reliable Corporation. And they are the ones that make predictions every year about what is likely to happen in this country in the, in the electricity sector area. And this year, as last year, they pred they're predicting that the United States, about two-thirds of the United States is going to have potentially significant trouble where the, the need for electricity is not going to be matched by the resources. So Pastor gave my disclaimer. I want to say also that even though what I say today should not be considered a reflection of anything, that has to do with the Public Service Commission itself. It is within our function, as you can see in this highlighted portion that is on our website. And it's also, this is part of our strategic plan. So it's also within, within that. So I consider this to be within the purview of the Public Service Commission. Questions I will address today. Was the Green New Deal designed to fail? If designed to fail, why? And who benefits? How might we turn this into a success story? People that know me know I'm never one to dwell on the negative. So the Green New Deal, for, for today's purposes, there could be other definitions or descriptions of it, but this is the description that I'm giving it. Strategies including government funding designed to replace hydrocarbon sources of fuel worldwide with green sources. These are some of the bills. You know, Hundreds of billions of dollars have been put towards this. It's a small sample. Saving the planet is, of course, a worthy cause, but we need to have a viable way to do it. Amen? So the Green New Deal is designed, I, I describe what it's designed to, to replace hydrocarbons with green sources, but it will not achieve net zero carbon emissions. Absolutely will not. And it will not eliminate pollution. And I'm going to go through the one reason for that, and it has to do with the mineral supply. There are a lot of other things that can be pointed to and discussed as to why it's not going to, why the new Green New Deal is not going to work. But I think the mineral aspect of it, the inadequacy of, our, of the minerals required for this Green New Deal, is one that's really well accepted and well known. Inarguable. So mining the minerals needed requires massive amounts of land, water, petrol, and human toil. This is an example, this is in Myanmar, this is a rare earth mining. I don't know how well you can, you can see it, but get an idea of the expanse. But if you look down here, 
These are cars down there. These are some buildings. So it gives you an idea of the amount of land that is used in this rare earth mining. And this is an, an open pit mine, so it goes way down. And if you, you can't really see it too well back there, but this, was, this is green foliage. It's very beautiful country, and that was there before this took it over. And this here, this is a, a vehicle. It burns 1,800 gallons of fuel in a 12-hour shift. This machine is required to move 500,000 pounds of earth in order to get the minerals needed for one single electric vehicle battery. And I doubt this guy's my size. He's probably a, a, a large man. So we're looking at a large truck here that's using a lot of, uh, a lot of petrol. Mining, open pit mining, it all looks about the same, no matter where you are. In, this, in these pictures, um, whoops. in these pictures, three out of five of these are in the United States. And hit this. So mining for minerals is done largely elsewhere in the world, generally the poorest countries and or countries hostile to the United States. Mining in poor, often hostile countries raises issues of supply chain reliability, national security, and conscience. This is an article that I read when I was campaigning for this position. It came out, it was an AP article in August of last year. And the sacrifice zone, Myanmar, bears the cost of green energy. This is a quote from it. The birds no longer sing and the herbs no longer grow. The fish no longer swim in rivers that have turned a murky brown. The people in this northern Myanmar forest have lost a way of life that goes back generations. But if they complain, they too face the threat of death. That's a quote from the article. This is one that came out in 2018 and it was about um, mining in the Congo. The dirty trade fueling our clean energy. And this was back in 2018, and they talked about the child labor and the brutality toward those children working in the mines. I call this the Blood Diamond colonial model of business. I, many of you probably saw the movie Blood Diamond. Those of you that did, didn't see it, it involves exploitation of the people and the land to get diamonds. And so I thought I was the first one to come up with that, calling it the Blood Diamond colonial model, but there's actually somebody that preceded me on that. I think it fits very well. These photos haunt me. There's a push, including economic incentives, for mining and production of these needed minerals in the United States. There's a big push for it. And the United States actually has the needed minerals, but here's the catch. Okay, we led in rare earth metal production back in 1985. The United States, the United States led it in the entire world. What happened in 90, 1985 is not that we ran out of rare earth metals. Rare earths are not rare, they're just not very concentrated. That's why they have to move so much land to, to get to them and use so much petroleum. So what happened in 1985, not that people didn't figure this out before, but they figured out that it's, it's a whole lot cheaper to collect all these minerals, to gather them on the backs of the poor people in these poor countries that we can exploit. And so we stopped doing it. So we have, we have the minerals. So when they talk about we're gonna make this domestic, we're gonna start doing it here. Anyway. So mining in our country is vastly more expensive because of our values and our high standards, at least theoretically. So fair wages, child labor laws, environmental protections, we have those in this country, they don't have those in those countries. That's why it's, it's so much cheaper to do there. It would be so expensive here. Even with our protections for workers and the environment, we do not eliminate damage to the environment. Mining in the United States, all looks about the same. So United States mining, more costly, slowed, often stopped by, regulatory landscape, by the regulatory landscape, and fraught with lawsuits. Lack of minerals results in not enough transformers, semiconductors, inverters, and transmission lines that we need for the Green New Deal. So that's why it's really 
not going to happen, and it's not going. It's not clean. So semiconductors, we hear about you know the chip shortage that we have, um, and, and inverters are required for for solar and wind energy and the, the lithium batteries to convert the electricity from direct current to alternating current. So they have to have inverters to, so that our appliances can function and we don't have enough inverters. We don't have enough transmission lines. One of the things with solar and wind, when you look at, I'm not talking about somebody that has it just up on their roof or something small, but when it comes to utility scale, these really large farms, they're out in the country. They're away from the trees and the mountains. They're out in the country. And so you have to have more transmission lines to bring it into the city where the people are. So, they, they, so solar and wind cannot make it without inverters, and they cannot make it with us putting in a tremendous amount of transmission lines, new ones in, and we don't have the minerals for it. Was the Green New Deal designed to fail? If designed to fail, why? Let's look at some facts and follow the money. Shortly after our government allocated billions of, of dollars for specific energy projects, the largest multinational corporations in the world accelerated acquisitions and mergers. It's a concentration of power here, and I'm gonna give you some of the headlines. This is just a small percentage of the things that I read almost every day this, this fall. For $4.9 billion, ExxonMobil acquired Denbury Incorporated, a developer of carbon capture and enhanced oil recovery. For $60 billion, ExxonMobil is acquiring Pioneer Natural Resources Oil and Gas Company. Chevron quickly responds to the ExxonMobil acquisition by acquiring Hess in a $60 billion deal. ExxonMobil and Chevron are in discussion to merge. Don't we have laws against this? Laws against concentration of power? Yes, we do. The Sherman Antitrust Act. Legislation enacted by Congress in 1890 to curb concentrations of power that interfere with trade and reduce economic competition. This, next, this is a beautiful irony here. Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, 1911. This Supreme Court case involved the country's largest corporation, Standard Oil, the predecessor of ExxonMobil. The court ruled in favor of the United States based on the Sherman Antitrust Act. This resulted in the breakup of Standard Oil into separate companies. So in 1911, they broke them up. 2023, we're bringing them back together. Latin term, cui bono, who benefits? Certain multinational corporations benefit from both the Green New Deal and its implosion. The Green New Deal projects we hear most about lately and they're getting most of the funding lately are hydrogen hubs and carbon capture. You see that in the news a lot. And guess who's getting the, guess who's getting the money? Oil companies are acquiring the largest government subsidies for these. And one of the things that I've discovered in my study is that hydrogen hubs and carbon capture, both of those, they're, they're not green. Um, hydrogen hubs, the hydrogen energy source that actually works that uses natural gas and carbon capture uh, it, it is used mainly to enhance oil recovery it's there's, there's nothing green about these and yet the green new deal funding is going to these kind of projects to the oil companies and government is choosing the winners and losers if oil companies in conjunction with our government gain control over your access to power, who benefits? Not you. How do we get to this point and how do we fix it? Suppressed competition, I talked about that. Fear mongering, we're all familiar with that and the power of that and divide and conquer. Just classic strategies in war. So Edmund Burke talked about, about fear and the ability to, to shut down the human mind, the, our ability to think for ourselves and even act in our best interest. That was in the 1700s. So what are the fears in the, in the energy sector? Fears of climate catastrophe is one, and the end of coal, oil, and gas use. So these are kind of the two, the two sides in this debate. Never let a good crisis go to waste. That did not start with Rahm Emanuel. That's been a, a strategy that's been used, used forever, and they utilize fear um, in, these, in these crises. 
It's the tactic of fear-mongering, fear scaring us into voluntarily trading cherished rights and freedoms for government protections. Divide and conquer. Back to those two sides. You know, there's, this, there's the side that talks about how the climate catastrophes, the things that we see where, where there's a lot of problems with climate, it's all caused by hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon sources of, of utilization for energy. That's what's causing all of our problems. And so we just need to get rid of hydrocarbons as sources of energy, and then everything's going to be wonderful and clean in the world. Then there's this other faction, that, and the, the ones that have this system, they say that it's settled science. It, hydrocarbons are the problem and that's how we have to save the planet. And then there's this faction, the settled science people, that say we need hydrocarbons, we will need them for the long haul. The thing is, they both have pieces to the puzzle. If you look at who is criticizing these mergers that are going on with the oil companies, it's the Democrat senators, right? They are the ones criticizing the mergers. And the other people on the other side are the ones that are criticizing the Green New Deal. So both of them have a piece of the puzzle. But if you could keep them divided and fighting with each other and, and mocking each other, then we never come together with this, this reality. DC backroom deals, we're familiar with those. Um, the military industrial complex is one. Medical industrial complex, including big pharma. Agriculture industrial complex. These kinds of backroom deals have been going on for ever. So the, the DC backroom deal outcomes are cloaked in government mandates, subsidies, and regulation that create distorted tax policies, skewed regulatory benefits, and pathways and incentives for industrial consolidations. Loss of local control, suppression of competition, inefficient markets, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Multinational corporations need votes for mandates, regulations, and subsidies. Some public officials willingly sell their influence in return. This is what we've got going. Is it possible multinational company managers and their political cronies are unaware of mineral unavailability and environmental issues with the Green New Deal? Is it possible they don't know about that? There's so much information out there that they definitely know it at this point, and they are still promoting the Green New Deal. They're still promoting it like this is the way of the future. We just need more lithium batteries. We need more you know, solar and wind projects, and then everything's going to be wonderful. They are still promoting it just as much, and they have this knowledge. Why do these wealthy corporations need your hard-earned tax dollars? You know, billions of dollars are going to these corporations. They don't. They don't need your money. From their cronies in government, what they need is mandates to solidify control for the crony capitalist economic system. Now this is old data here. It says the average net worth of a senator goes up 1.6 million yearly while on a $174,000 salary. This is old data because I think they've given themselves two or three raises <laughs> since then. And now that we have digital currency, the, the bribes that they receive, we can't even trace them. Old data. So obviously crony capitalism is sustainable. These folks are doing just fine that are getting the money in the backroom deals. But is it the end game? Or is crony capitalism a stepping stone to another economic system, serfdom? wherein you will own nothing and be happy. <laughs> the Road to Serfdom, this was written back in the 1940s, um, it, and it talks about these same principles. This has been planned going on for a very, very long time. We'll we are well on our way. Can't we invoke antitrust laws designed to protect from monopoly control? Sure, but there's no law against not enforcing the law. And so we have these laws in place, but if they don't enforce it, it's, nothing is going to happen. This is just going to continue on. And so the, 
Democrat senators that are bringing to light what's going on with the, you know, bring, raising concerns about these monopolies, they go to the Federal Trade Commission, and then if, if nothing happens in that, then I think there's a fair possibility that the Democrats are in on this too. What can we do to keep the lights on? One, recognize the influence and consequences of crony capitalism. People sometimes mistake it for free market capitalism, and that's a big mistake. And I think what, what I, I see potentially happening down the road is that people are gonna see the um, multinational corporations and their government cronies kind of the heroes to save us from the Green New Deal. And I think that's what we're gonna be seeing in the future, and they might even usher in a candidate that would look like they're gonna save us from the Green New Deal. Insist on honest dialogue and analysis. Don't ignore the 800 pound gorillas in the room. Don't let fear be a guiding force. That's a big one. Be calm in the recognition that we have an abundance of energy resources in this country. So one of the things that we're talking about for a strategy for resource adequacy and to keep the lights on is regionalization. It's one of the things we are talking about and I plan on being very involved in that is the use of complementary and supplementary energy resources in a re within a region. Here's some states, I call this a corridor of research rich states, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, Arizona. And, I'm, and one of the reasons why, I mean there are a lot of ways that the regionalization could be divided up. One of the reasons I choose these states is that to, to my knowledge they have not yet chosen state policies that are self-destructive. The plus. So the other thing is, and I'm gonna talk about the different resources in each of these states, the reason why the pieces of these puzzles can be put together with these particular states. So in those six states, we have the top, the number one state for sun is Arizona, number three, is Nevada, number nine is Utah. So in that corridor of states, we have the top nine sunniest states for use of solar. Montana doesn't fare so well. We, in, in Kalispell, it, we have fully sunny days less than a, a quarter of the year, and our sunniest cities are, have less sun than, say, Texas's least sunny cities. So we don't do very well in the sunshine category but we have, we have a tremendous amount of hydroelectricity. Um, for hydroelectric generation, Montana's number seven in the nation, so that's a big deal. And you can see that Idaho and Arizona have some, Nevada, Utah, not so, you know, and Wyoming, not so much. But you know, hydroelectric, again, complementary, supplementary, working together. Wind, you look here, and Wyoming has a fair amount of wind, Montana, not, not some, a little bit. Um, Idaho, some. Those other three states, not very much. So Montana doesn't have very much in terms of, of wind overall in the state. However, there are portions of Montana where wind farms are appropriate and could be helpful and could be complementary and supplementary. Coal, Montana is number one for usable coal reserves in the nation. And we are not number one for production, but it is there, these are, and these are coal-rich states. Montana is the most coal-rich state, but Wyoming has quite a bit, and, um, and Utah some. This is natural gas by area. The states are outlined there in black. You can see Wyoming has a fair amount, Utah some, the rest of the states not so much, but not zero. Geothermal, that's one of the, my favorite clean energies. Anyway, you can look, we're, uh, this, this particular corridor of states is very rich in geothermal energy. You look at Nevada, tremendous. Arizona, you know, Montana has some on, on one side of it, Idaho some. So that's another one that you just gotta look at the su supplementary and complementary sources of energy. So we can do it together. And I know it seems like a, a like it's gonna, it would be a difficult task to do this right, and it seems like a David and Goliath type of fight, but I personally prefer the David and Goliath fights because then when we succeed, God gets the glory. Amen. Thank you.